My main interest, uh, is, uh, as Bob said at the start, uh, regulation and, uh, and Senate uh, inquiries. I, I followed this uh, saga from a distance, of course, uh, as a supporter. I'm not, uh, even though I've barracked for Essendon all my life, uh, I've also barracked for the Chicago Cubs, so had one victory this year. Um, I, my principal, uh, I, I suppose, I, when I saw this saga emerge, um, I, I felt great empathy for the people who were targeted. Um, that was my first reaction. I, I don't believe in trial by media. Uh, I've seen enough of it. I had a long, for about a quarter of a century, I've been advocating for all sorts of issues to do with governance and regulation, uh, particularly whistleblowing. And um, I've organised a lot of national conferences on whistleblowing and regulation. So when I saw this issue, I, I having a lot of experience in these types of problems, I uh, naturally thought, um, because I don't like to see targeting and I don't like to see unfairness, and, that, and that's what I saw in this problem right the way through. I've written a lot for the Melbourne Age, for example, and I know the current editor. For, um, in fact, he was the journalist on a case for me many years ago. Um, I, I was surprised with the way journalism ran through this problem because th this was a regulatory problem and regulation it requires wisdom. It doesn't require the uh, opinion of the mob um, the mob is never the arbiter of democracy. You need considered opinion and you need people who are seasoned, experienced. And regulation's about prescribing, uh, using the prescribed laws to regulate equally and fairly. So my purpose of my talk tonight is, uh, I, I thought about this issue quite a lot. It's not my main uh, concern not like it is for a quite a few people here and I understand their passion, but I, I have thought about this problem and, I, and it's puzzled me with a support base like Essendon that you can't break through. Uh, it really has, I must say, really perplexed me. I, I've, I've, I know a lot of people want to move on. They don't want to, they don't want the negativity anymore. But that's very unfair to the wrong that's been done and the people who've been wronged. And um, I think all of us want to find a mechanism to get traction for this problem in a, in a proper forum. It's clear that the legal processes have exhausted themselves and the only real avenue at the moment is through the parliament, through the representative democracy, through a Senate inquiry. I've, as, as Bob said, I've been before many Senate inquiries over a long period of time. And it seems to me that at the moment is the immediate mechanism. It's the question of how to get that traction. And I mean, a lot of people talk about the smoking gun. I actually, and I'll put this in the slides tonight, I don't actually think it's the smoking gun. I think it's looking at the problem in a different way. And that's what I'll put to you tonight. And it mightn't be fully accurate. There's a lot of people in this room who know a lot more about this issue than I do. As I said, I felt I've followed it at a detached, uh, I, you know, I've been like everybody appalled at the unfairness and the targeting, but I, I don't have the time to go through all the intricacies. But I've looked at it in the general sense. I've read both the judgments. And I'm going to go through I, the, the framework as I see it and what we might be able to do about it um, to convince people who simply don't haven't read all about the problem. I mean, I talk to a lot of people uh, you know, I'm chairing a meeting tomorrow night and I know everybody in that room, they don't, they don't relate to this problem. They turn off. They have a very simplistic view of it and that's what we're facing. But we need to somehow engage them. And I think, I think um, I, I, the, the outline of the talk, I'm going to start with, a, this is very basic stuff, you know, whatever, kindergarten regulation. What's regulation? Why is anti-doping regulation different? And I'll talk about the red flags in this problem. Because this problem had so many anomalies in it, in terms of regulation. 
I, I will briefly talk about the legal issues. Uh, Stephen's, I, I think, talked very well about that and why a Senate inquiry is needed. What is regulation? Regulation, we set laws and regulators regulate those laws. They are the agents for politicians. So, as Stephen said in that interview, ASIC is a regulator and they have certain powers. ASADA has, is a regulator and they regulate those laws. What regulators do is arbitrate between private and public interest. In other words, when we're regulating about fraud or bribery, or doping in sport, we're trying to protect the public interest. The public interest in sport is fairness, a level playing field. And what regulators are doing are trying to, to maintain that level playing field in the case of sport. But a regulator is more than that. So when Stephen was talking about independence, what our regulators, and this is not just ASADA, this is ASIC, this is APRA, this is our 11 main regulators in this country. They need to go back to school about what regulation is. Because regulation is like being a portfolio manager. You've got at least four components to that portfolio. You've got the infractions of the regulations. In other words, the, they're the cop. They're the, and in this case, they brought in a cop to regulate this problem. And he's an old style regulator. He doesn't think about the other aspects of the portfolio. He certainly thinks about that because the deterrence, the second uh, aspect of the, of the problem, because regulation has two main aspects to it, as that is penalise the violations of say, in this case, the codes but deter the future violations. Now, in the case of, uh, I've been pushing for an act for Australia for about 20 years now, and we're likely to get it soon. And this, I, I think that will give you a time frame of how long these things take. They, take. they take 20 years to turn these problems around because everyone has history and you need to move the key players aside before you get the changes required in the legislation. But with, with regulation, there are two main aspects. There's penalising what's happened and deterring what will happen. And most regulation is about a balance between, say, 40% penalties, 60% deterrence. In anti-corruption, and anti-doping is like anti-corruption, it's more weighted to 10% penalties, 90% deterrence. I've done simulations on this for various acts in the US, and that's the, that's the split. These type of regulators, though, do not think at all about the other aspects of the portfolio. You must protect the rights of respondents, of witnesses, and whistleblowers. That's what it's all about. Regulators, for whatever reason, are not protecting those rights. And when Jason talked about athletes, he's right. I, I, I look at this, I can't believe that the various athletic associations are putting up with com their complete um, denial of their rights. And the last thing a regulator has to do is manage their own conflict of interest. They cannot be conflicted with any other party. They have to be an independent party. They regulate, they're regulating someone else's conflict of interest, so they can't have one themselves. Now the problem of course in the world is no one is independent. Everybody has conflicts all over the place. When I was grading students in my time at university, you know, obviously you think some students are nicer people than other students, but it should never interfere with your assessment of those. A, 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 a good academic is trained to be as independent as they can be. They have to call things always without fear or favour. But unfortunately, we're living in a world where there's so much fear and so much favour 
that we're not getting that omniscience that we need. We're not getting that independence. And that's what Stephen was talking about. What is interesting is the new WADA code next year has built into it two provisions, which is that the code has been drafted to consideration the principles of proportionality and human rights. These are two insertions in the new code from 2015 to 2017. And it suggests to me that, that WADA is realising that they've been infringing rights. Now, of course, that's nominal stuff. That's, that's the sort of motherhood statements that you see all the time in, so, in this sort of area. But it is, it is recognition that they realise they're starting to impact on rights. My view with that is the following. If an Essendon came, case came up again, we would never see it done like this ever again. But the question is, we need to make sure that it's not done like this again, but we also need to make sure that those people who've been most unfairly characterised in this problem, that we find some way that their, their reputations are fully restored as they should be. The anti toping regulation, I'm going to go through this quickly, has five key components to it which uh, cause it to be what it is. I'll talk about it briefly. The pyramid of regulation, the regulations themselves, which are the codes, the testing of those codes, the reversal of the onus of proof, which leads to the show cause notices, and the standard of proof itself. Those components are the regulatory framework of anti-doping. And the first of those components is this pyramid of regulation. Now, this is a very uh, much like a monopoly or a closed shop of regulation. What happened with this is at the top of the pyramid is the International Olympic Committee. And they created the Court of Arbitration of Sport in 1994 and the IAAF. Now, those three bodies at the top of the pyramid are riddled with conflict of interest, as we all know. It's not just in salaries, it's in appointments to each other to they virtually are the same body. They tried, because, anti, because the problem of doping really was accentuated in the 1990s, they created an organisation called WADA, which was supposed to be semi-independent, the regulatory authority. But WADA, of course, is almost completely comprised of people who are on the Court of Arbitration of Sport and the International Olympic Committee and the IAAF. WADA was never an independent body, was never an independent regulator. And that is where the problem started for this particular problem with Essendon. Now, governments throughout the world decided that they needed to have national agencies, which were created, of course, with the ASADA Act of, say, 2005 and UCAD. There are about 70 such national agencies, but 20 only that are active, which met in, in Copenhagen about uh, two months ago. What is happening now is WADA is wanting to break away from the IOC because of what happened over the Russian doping scandal. But of course, WADA wants to be at the top of the pyramid of regulation. That's what's now emerging rather than the IOC. But they can't break free because they depend so much on the International Olympic Committee. Where this has come to, if you like, to a head is what happened this year. And interestingly, it happened because of the Russian doping scandal and because of the fact that they didn't listen to whistleblowers who'd been talking to WADA for four years and never be listened to. They had gone to German media. Eventually, it fed into the Washington Post and the New York Times. And it led to a senator from South Dakota who chairs the Senate committee on uh, commerce, science and transportation, writing a letter to the head of, uh, of, of WADA, the president of WADA, Sir Craig Reedy. I'll just read a couple of, if you, you can't read it. Finally, the committee is aware of concerns that WADA lacks the independence to fulfil its mission. WADA's governing rules allow its board members to also to serve an executive capacity for sports organisations 
For example, the President of WADA, but you're also the IOC Vice President. Why is that relevant? Because when it came to the Essendon decision in the Court of Arbitration of Sport, the person who chaired that panel was Michael Belloff. Now, as most of you possibly know the background of Michael Belloff, but he's, he's been involved with the CAS for, since 1994, since its inception. He's also a very distinguished lawyer. He's a, an expert on administrative law and sports law. One of the problems with sports law is, and sports regulation is there's so few experts. If you pick up the handbook of sports regulation, it's got the same sort of people always writing in it. It's a closed shop. So Belloff has written many opinions for WADA, at least 16 that I've counted. And uh, he wrote the opinion. Now, I don't disagree with this opinion. There was an athlete, you, you know, you would have heard of him, Dwayne Chambers, who'd be banned for life by the uh, British Olympic Association. He argued the case against that ban, that lifetime ban, in time for the British Olympics, for the London Olympics. And of course, Chambers was cleared to be able to compete. Now, I don't dis disagree with the position, but that was trying to assert the supremacy of WADA over the Brit British Olympic Association. It was also very convenient because it allowed a British athlete to compete in the London Olympics. Now, a person outside would say there's a conflict of interest there or a perception of conflict of interest. But I don't, as I say, I don't disagree with the decision. The problem is of the perception of conflict of interest between various parties at every level of this regulatory pyramid. The pyramid has conflict of interest in other ways. It's with governments. The Russian government is dealt with very different from the Kenyan government and the Mexican government, for example, as has been the case in the last 12 months. There's a conflict of interest with pharmaceutical companies. Before the London Olympics, GlaxoSmithKline entered a, a deal with, the, with WADA about the testing of the clinical trials, the testing of, of substances. There's a conflict of interest with sporting bodies. FIFA took six or so years to sign up to the codes. The NFL and the NBA, as Jason has observed, will not adhere to the codes at all. WADA is underfunded. It only has $30 million of funding, $25 million of which is by the United States. That's why John Thune can write to the head of WADA and demand answers. That's why Susan Lay can't write to the head of WADA and demand answers. And that is, our, that is the problem with this very closed shop framework. WADA is now seeking extra funding. Uh, they're having a meeting this month. They're searching for funds from pharmaceutical companies. In, in the work I've done, in the, particularly in the United States, on anti-corruption measures, the pharmaceutical industry accounts for 30 or 40 per cent of the claims, the false claims, uh, using the False Claims Act in the United States. It's one of the industries you would put a red flag as, as high as you like. It started 30 years ago with the fence industry. Now it's the pharmaceuticals industries where you get the most most problems with corruption. The implication of this framework is as follows. WADA has a very limited budget. It's riddled by conflict of interest. It wants to deter doping. Because as Jason has, has indicated, and as Bob has indicated, doping is rampant. But the sophisticated dopers are doping small and often in long lead-up times to the event in question. They know what to do. They're not the ones that WADA catches. So what does WADA do? They want to signal that they're an active regulator, an effective regulator. 
So if they get a chance, they target. And that's exactly what the anti-doping framework is about. It's about tar targeting. So athlete A will be treated differently from athlete B. Sporting body A gets different treatment from sporting body B. Country A is treated differently from country B. Drug A from drug B. It's a very predictable model. If you've got not much funds, you want to show that you're worth something, you want to signal to the world that you're doing something, you target. The moment you get a small problem, you can hit it hard and that's exactly what happened. Over a long period of time, that's what regulation has been about. The anti-doping codes are almost as, as both Bob and Jason have observed. I mean, I've got a PhD, I'm not completely ignorant. I went to look at for thymosin beta-4 in the 2012 and the 2015 codes, couldn't find them. This is a branching process, S0 to S8 is the, uh, the, the, the three main categories, S0, S1, S2. You simply will not, an 18, 19, 20 year old athlete would have no chance whatsoever of unravelling uh, this, for this particular problem. But there's another problem, and just before I get on to that, I'll, I'll, Bob's referred to this email from Stephen Watt of Asada to, uh, to someone in WADA, July 3rd, 2002. This is important because it'll come up in a later slide. Subject, thymomodulin. I want to inquire if WADA has considered the prohibited status of the drug thymomodulin, also known as thymosin. Bob didn't talk about the response from WADA. I certainly don't know anything like these guys about biochemistry and that, but I went back and looked at a few articles on thiomodulin. The first article that I found, could find appeared in 1986. And here's a guy from WADA responding, the list committee discussed thymosin beta forward and considered it prohibited. However, it's not clear what kind of thymosin thymomodulin is. And it goes on. Now, I'm, I'm staggered by that because there, was, there were clinical trials about thymomodulin back in 1986 reported in journals, long time ago. So I'm, I'm puzzled about the ignorance of the people running both ASADA and WADA. It's their job. And then we go to the testimony before the Senate Committee Estimates Committee's that Bob's referred to and Jason's referred to this year, March the 3rd this year. It's very revealing about what this problem is about. Senator Dina Tarly asked, a moment ago you told us that you did not know what this stuff TV4 does. Now you're saying it makes the players bigger and stronger. Which one is it? McDevitt replies, don't forget there were multiple substances here. Then he goes on, Senator Dina Natale asks, that is irrelevant because they're not found guilty of other substances. So what does it do? Does it make you bigger and stronger or we don't know? And McDevitt replies, as I said earlier, we do not know everything it does. This is primarily promoted in my understanding for recovery. And then Dean Natale, I, I thought he put this well. To be clear, you're saying that on one hand it makes the people bigger and stronger. Then we're talking about recovery. Then we're saying we do not know what it does. Isn't it fair to say there's a good chance this stuff, stuff does nothing for performance? And McDevitt says, I doubt it, and then says, well, what's the evidence? What's the evidence from proves recovery? McDevitt says, I'll have to take that on notice. <laughs> and of course, he hasn't replied. You see, in this problem, and you, you read that out, and you wonder, if you read that out to a group of Hawthorne supporters here or a, a, a people from uh, another code, would they start to realise what this problem's about? That's what we've got to think about strategically, how we get traction, how we turn the 6,500 on Phil's petition into 600,000. How do we get those people to engage that this is a great injustice and what's more, it's a great regulatory failure. 
These codes are extraordinarily, not only are they completely and utterly diffuse to any reasonable human being, they change all the time. Between 2009 and 2015, the WADA codes had 2,269 changes in six years. 50 different working drafts were considered. These codes are virtually continuously evolving. Not only the codes continuously evolving, but the tests for them. Now, Jason's talked about this. There's, you know, at one end of regulations is a group of thinking, a libertarian view, if you like, Milton Friedman would be pleased that I'm saying this, allow for everything. At the other end, you test for everything. It's just not possible. Thymosin itself, just this compound, 2012 there were 16 variations. Now there's 27. Who knows? Five years' time there might be 50. My PhD was in statistics. I know how absurd this is to test. You simply cannot test in each direction. You will never be able to discriminate across these 27 varieties of thymosin. You will not be able to ever get a test to be able to do that. It is simply going to be impossible. And, and in a sense, um, there are coherent people who understand this. There's a professor at Oxford, Julian Savalescu. Some of you might know him. We invited him to present. He's, at, he's running a conference today in Oxford. He was very keen but he's busy all day, but he, so he sends his regards. And his view is that instead of testing in every possible substance, you test for something endogenous. In other words, something in the body, something in the metabolism. And he's, you know, I had to look this up. I had to research. I thought someone's going to ask me what EPO is. Uh, someone's going to ask me my, what hematocrit is. Um, hematocrit is the space where the blood cell that the blood cells effectively occupy. So there, there, there are sort of thresholds. And that threshold that he suggests, if it's less than 50, which is the limit set now, you're able to compete, whether it's exogenously given to you or endogenously. You see, what people didn't understand with TB4, it's in your body to start with. It's in the platelet cells. Some of the, some of the things that they allow have got TB4 in them. Some of the things that WADA allows has got TB4 in it. So TB4 is not a standalone. It's across all these other substances. So Savalescu's point is a very good one. That is the way we should be heading. We need an omnibus test, not a test for everything. We want to see whether the body has gone up or down in an, a window around the day you perform. That is the way this must head. Science will tell you that. Science will lead you in that direction. Now, what is interesting is Michael Belloff is in the Blackstone Chambers in London. There's a quote from William Blackstone from 1765. It's one of the most famous quotes. I'm sure, sure you've heard of it. It's a maxim of English law that it's better that 10 guilty men or women should escape than one innocent man should suffer. I've just replaced that than 34 innocent men, and as Bob says, 34 plus, plus one particularly and many others. That presumption of innocence and the and the right to be able to prove your innocence is in all, uh, what I would say is human rights uh, precepts throughout the world. It's in the 14th Amendment of the United States, which is the right to guarantee and not be deprived of life, liberty and property. It's in the International Covenants. It's in the European Convention. The Australian Constitution doesn't have it in it, but it should doesn't expressly express protect the presumption of innocence, but it may be considered, as the Australian Law Reform Commission notes, 
part of the broader concept of a fair trial. Fair trial entrenched in common law. What happens in the anti-daping framework is there's also a reversal of the onus of proof. You must be accountable of everything that goes into your body. And as Jason alluded to, the issue of, and Bob as well, the issue of painkillers and the possibility they're also performance enhancing. I, I have argued for this reversal of onus of proof in a particular act that I've been pushing for a long time. But as Stephen suggested, it's got to be balanced against rights. The rights to, of an evidentiary standard that's consistent with that. The ability to prove that you're innocent. An onus of proof was there a lot in anti-corruption legislation so as to prove, try to flush out the corrupt party and it was easier to prove guilt. What WADA has done is used that own, reversal of the onus of proof with a very low evidentiary standard, low standard of proof to basically target athletes. And that's exactly what they're doing. It started with the International Olympic Committee and the strict liability principle, which was adopted before 2000 and that WADA adopted in 2004 and it went into these uh, show cause notices. And so what happened in the Essendon case, you heard a lot of discussion about comfortable satisfaction, <laughs> which is an interesting term in itself. But, but uh, uh, comfortable satisfaction means something higher than balance of probabilities. Now, what is balance of probabilities? Balance of probabilities is something I would suggest appreciably above 50%. Uh, I think uh, McDevitt in his answer said 60. I would say something in the order of 50, 55. Because we don't want 50-50. We don't want a Brexit situation here. Um, beyond reasonable doubt is, of course, usually regarded as something like 98%. The Essendon case, if you go through the Court of Arbitration of Sport ruling... I'll get to that in a minute, but I did my PhD in statistics. So I know a lot about objective probability. I know as much as you about subjective probability. But when I looked at the CAS ruling and tried to add up what I thought were the probabilities, I could get to not more than 20%. And yet the CAS ruling said, Something above what I interpreted as comfortable satisfaction meant really in the 60 to plus percent range. That's how far they were below proving what to an independent observer. And I, I, I completely took off my affiliations to the red and black. I think it was no more than 20%, if, if that. That's how much below they are what they said they were. And why is it that they were so far? Why can I say that? Well, there were no athlete submissions. There was no credible testimony because the testimony from Alavi and Charter and others was almost completely discredited. There was no reliable documentary evidence or analytical data from either an A or a B sample. The only evidence they had were text messages. Text messages, they relied completely on text messages and associating TB4 with the word recovery. And that's how they built their case. Let me just sum up that. The, the problem with anti-doping is you've got conflict of interest, you had new legislation, you had a very inexperienced regulator, you had codes which are really changing all the time and uncertain, the tests are useless, you've got this reversal of onus of proof and you've got very low evidentiary standards, what do you get as a result? You get risk. And who bears the risk? The athletes. They lose their rights, they get risk of targeting because they're targeting because they want to single, signal their efficacy 
rather than they want to protect uh, the, uh, you know, the sport. The main risk, of course, is that the athlete cannot prove their innocence. Now, let me get now to the main point I was going to make. That's why I did want to continue. I, I've had a lot of experience with the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act in the United States. Jimmy Carter brought it in in 1977. One of the things that in, in that act is what's called red flags. When, a, when you think a, an organisation is behaving corruptly, you put up a red flag. But what you can do for an organisation, you can also do for a regulator. Now, the first red flag in this problem was what Stephen talked about, the joint investigation. What this is an example of is regulatory capture. In this problem, both the AFL and Essendon should have been under investigation, not AFL and ASADA investigating Essendon. And the reason I say that is is actually, curiously, it's in the Court of Arbitration of Sport decision. In paragraph 135, they refer to a peptide manual that was sent out by, from Alavi's, the compounding pharmacist in uh, South Yarra, which discovers, discusses all of the peptides that manufactured at Coma were sent out to several AFL clubs. Now, you might think that's, and it in, discusses the properties of TB4 and not any other form of thymosin. Now, you might say to yourself, well, what's the big deal about that? Well, with the level, the standard of proof adopted by the CAS, that was enough to warrant an investigation of those other clubs. In other words, it should not just have been Essendon. So in the CAS decision itself, there is a sense that other clubs should have been investigated. Why were they dealing with the larvae? Why did they want their manual? Why? And the manual had TB4 mentioned in it. That's the first, but that's a very small relative to the second. There was a, it's, it, and it is interesting with, when you look, uh, Bruce Francis, as you all know, has been, been very good. Uh, a lot of detail about this problem. But the problem for an outsider and the problem for another supporter or someone independent to this is that they, there's, there's too much. They're not interested, they've made up their minds and they want to, they want to move on. They're not going to be brought back to the problem unless there's something that really is compelling to them. And it's got to be simple. And surprisingly, and I might be jumping the gun a bit here, but it goes back to a program that the ABC 730 report ran in uh, April 2013, soon after this problem started. 730, and I haven't seen any refutation by ASADA to this. So the caveat is this is a secondary source, but I gather because it hasn't been refuted that it must be accurate. So let's look at the conversation or let's look at the details of this program. 730 obtained a series of text messages spanning more than six months between Stephen Dank and Melbourne's club doctor, Dan Bates, between mid-2012 and February 5, 2013. Bates to Dank. Trengove is not going to Darwin, so I don't need the thymomodulin for tomorrow. Bates to Dank, when can we book the guys for the injections? We will need to give them times. Bates to Dank, mate, what's the final word on the injections? I have players calling me for confirmation. Dank to Bates, spoke to Asada, they were confirmed by email, no issues therein. In late January 2013, a timetable for injections was set out for seven players. As ABC 730 noted, the text showed Dank and Bates discussed a wide range of substances, including AOD 9604, cerebrosin, and thymomodulin. Now, let's look at that. 
That's texts. That is the same standard of evidence that the Court of Arbitration of Sport used to find the Essendon players guilty. Now, we think about two clubs. Essendon's program ran from November 2011 to May 2012. Melbourne's began in mid-2012 and ran through to February, 2000, February the 5th, 2013. I've drawn up a spreadsheet here. I know that's a dirty word in this, uh, in this problem, but it's a spreadsheet of uh, limited form. First half, Melbourne, a tale of two clubs. First half of 2012, second half of 2012. And I've put the architect. The architect was Stephen Dank as we all know. It was both, for both clubs, a supplements program with multiple individuals. In both clubs, there were injections. In both clubs, no positive samples. In both clubs, there was secrecy, and I would describe it as competitive secrecy. In both clubs, the evidence is there of electronic texts. Admittedly, a more limited program with Melbourne but the evidence is there. The most important thing, though, is this reference to thymomodulin. Think through the logic of the problem. Rather than think of the smoking gun, think of the logic. Asada did not penalise Melbourne. Not to my knowledge. And Asada has not refuted this. That means that Asada has accepted, remember the text, electronic text of the standard of evidence. Asada has accepted that Stephen Dank used thymomodulin and AOD 9604 at Melbourne. They have accepted that because they haven't penalised them. They have accepted. They, if, if they didn't accept that, they would have been looking for thymosin beta-4. They have accepted that Melbourne and Dank prescribed thymomodulin and AOD 9604. So there are only two possibilities. And this is how simple this problem really should be. Either Dank used thymosin beta-4 at Essendon and then flipped over and started using thymomodulin in the second half of the year, or Dank used thymomodulin on both programs. It's as simple as that. Which is it? Did Dank switch from thymosin beta-4 to thymomodulin? Or did he keep with thymomodulin all through 2012? Now, I looked at this question logically rather than with a, a sense of bias. And I started to think, well, how would you work out what the probabilities of that were? Because that is the question. It's got nothing to do with strands of the cable. It's got no, the links of the chain was compelling, but that's the question. Did Dank switch over from thymosin beta-4 to thymomodulin? And the answer is almost certainly no. And the answer is that, as we've been told all through this problem, if you had to tell me who do you think was the most honest witness in this whole matter, I'm sure you would come up with the same answer I came up with. The most honest witness is the one who lost the Brownlow medal. And why is that? Because he revealed to everyone that he'd been injected with AOD 9604. No cheat would ever do that because it was uncertain what the status of AOD 9604 was at the time. The person, the CAS and ASADA and WADA should have listened to 
was the fixed point of the problem, the one, I'm not saying he was the only one who told the truth, but he was the one who really told the truth, the one that really should have been listened to. Because no cheat is on national television and says, I was injected with AOD 9604. I was at Subiaco Oval that week. I, was happy, I happened to be in Perth and I watched that game and I was delighted in a group of Eagles supporters. I was so pleased for the club. And I heard all the booing that our present coach didn't hear. But there is no doubt that Joe Watson told the truth. So if he told the truth in such an open matter, I have no doubts he, this testimony is true. He told Asada he was injected with a legal form of thymosin. His testimony was not included in Asada's interim report. His description understood to match a bottle of thymomodulin stored in Dank's fridge. And I think you've, you know the rest of the story. And what was Ben McDevitt's, the CEO of Asada's, response to this issue of thymomodulin at the Senate Estimates Committee this year, March the 3rd. Frankly, this stuff about thymomodulin, the good thymosin, was shown to be absolute rubbish. The first reason why I don't think there's a compelling case that Dank switched from thymomodulin beta 4 in the first half of the year to thymomodulin in the second is the testimony of Joe Watson. The second reason is on July the 3rd, the inquiry to WADA was about thymomodulin. You see, if Dank was worried about thymomodulin beta 4, there should have been some text message towards Asada or WADA. There wasn't. Otherwise, they would have been included it in the SAS finding and WADA would have used it. They were looking for anything. They were targeting people. There's no evidence whatsoever of thymosin beta 4 at Essendon, any, any text messages or otherwise. So that's the second reason. The third reason, I think, and this sounds a little bit more conspiratorial, but I've had so much experience of regulators over such a long period of time. Why were the text messages associated with Melbourne never produced to either the CAS hearing or the AFL hearing. That was not accidental. Because those text messages suggested that Dank indeed used thymomodulin at some stage during 2012. The answer to whether Essendon were injected with thymomacin beta 4 didn't look, did, that answer wasn't found backwards. In 2011, it was found forwards. It was found in the next program that Dank went on to. Because why would he, if thymosin beta 4 being so effective, why would he switch? He didn't have any determination at that stage that it was illegal. Why would he switch? He would stay with thymosin the thymomodulin, the good thymosin, as he described it. And the last reason I think Dank stayed with thy the thymomodulin, why, the reason I think he also, a, a compelling reason, is that we are creatures of habit. We don't switch like that. If it's working, we typically stay with it. And, I mean, CAS themselves said, Essendon won eight of the first nine games in the 2013 season. In other words, there's not a case that he switched. It doesn't stand up. The evidence in the Melbourne matter was the most significant evidence there. It's been there all the way along. Asada have not refuted it. Asada have never referred to it. The CAS would never drew attention to it. It's the most relevant evidence of all. It wasn't back towards 2011 that mattered, it was what Dank went on to that mattered, and that's the key, in my view, to the case. The case is as simple as that. 
if you want to convince one of your um, one of your non Essendon people about this matter, it's on this slide. You've got two programs in the same year. One is penalised three times. The other is penalised not at all. The evidence to penalise Essendon was exactly the same standard of proof as the evidence that has exonerated Melbourne. I'm not, I, you know, I don't dislike the Melbourne Football Club. I'm just, comes back to this issue of targeting. This was targeting without question. And to get the traction needed from other people outside of this room, it's got to be brought down to that level of simplicity. Um, I see that our time is, is, is getting on. Um, I won't go through the rest of my slides, but I'll finish with one slide um, which goes into the need for a Senate inquiry. The legal processes in this matter have been exhausted. Uh, Stephen referred to the, uh, the matters in the federal court. A Senate inquiry has the advantage, allows a range of views. It allows us to look forward. It allows us to show the common sense we need for this sort of problem. We don't need targeting. We don't need regulators who try to, to smash a small problem with a, essentially a nuclear bomb. We need people with balance who are portfolio managers who, who look at the rights of individuals. We need to review this regulatory framework. It is a very unbalanced framework which allows this targeting to exist. We need to establish regulatory standards so regulators have to be accountable. I don't believe the current system works across, and this is not just a SADA, this is across all regulators. In the Murray report in December 2014, they recommended a, another regulator to regulate the regulators. Um, hierarchical regulation is one way to go. I believe we have to have permanent Senate committees like they have in the United States, where ASADA has to go before a Senate committee, not just when they feel like it, not just once a year, but per every whatever. They have to appear before that committee to be able to justify an investigation like this. Evidentiary standards have to change. We cannot have a situation where people are found guilty, if they use that word, when the probability of this happening is, is really about 20% at most. And most importantly, and I didn't go to this issue, the right to a fair trial. That's what we're about. We're not a society that's trying to destroy people. We shouldn't be. We should be a, a society which brings people together, to use a cliche from a former election. A society that looks at things in balance, doesn't run trials through the front page of newspapers, looks at it in balance, protects people's rights. And that right of the appeal to the High Court is the most important thing we've got in our constitution. These players deserved the right to appeal to the High Court on this matter. Last night in this building, the Chief Justice of the High Court appeared. And I'm sure he would have agreed with that proposition. There is no doubt when the Australia Act was set up in 1986, it was the Privy Council of England told us that Australians and the Australian High Court is the place to determine your attitudes, determine your, what you want. Believe it or not, I said many, a number of years ago when this Essendon matter arose, I, I've had a lot of familiarity with a case in France in the 1890s, the Dreyfus case, which rewrote, if you like, French law. This case, I said to someone at the time, I only joked, fancy a case like football. But then I thought to myself, yes, 
Only a case like this would start to convince Australians of their need to be able to preserve the right to prove your innocence. Dreyfus was very similar, the right to produce their evidence, his innocence. It became a very important case in French law for a century. This case, I'd hope, like to think that would underscore a lot of legislation in the future to protect rights and to protect the right to pr prove your innocence and to protect that appeal to the High Court. Thanks for your time. I know I've gone over, but uh, I think it's been worth uh, expositing that. <laughs>